We'll talk about the emergency uh, cranial and spinal radiological assessment. Uh, this is a very broad topic, and I will discuss essentially the basics of uh, the imaging modalities that we use, including MRI and CT. This will be very, very basic. We'll cover a variety of, of images. Um, this talk was originally about 85 slides. I took out all the word slides. So we're just going to look at uh, in pictures today, for the for the most part. Um, but whenever you get a radiologic study, you need to verify what image type you're getting, exactly what you're looking for. Make sure that it's the correct patient, that it's the correct date. I can't tell you how many times I've said that I'm looking at an MRI scan that was from seven or eight years ago rather than uh, last week. Uh, so you look at the original scan, so there's not much on here, and it turns out that, in fact, the newer scan has quite a bit on it. All right? And then look at the orientation. Things are very standard as far as uh, orientation of images go, so that should not be a major consideration. So uh, when we talk about CT scan, we talk about density. So things are hyperdense or hypodense, and that's all based upon the Hounsfield unit, which is arbitrarily defined um, as being a negative 1,000 for, for no attenuation, such as, such as air, versus water, which is set at a Hounsfield unit of zero, and dense bone as plus 1,000. Um, each CT scan varies, so you have to look at the, uh, the individual scanner to understand exactly what their, their scale is. Um, there's the ability now to actually focus on certain little areas of the bone in the spine, for instance, so that you can uh, calculate a bone mineral density based on the Hounsfield units. But it has to be a very small area of bone and can be uh, fairly accurate. Remember that you can also window a CT scan so that you can look at brain parenchyma versus bone so that you have exquisite detail of either structure. CT scans have become very accurate now, such that sometimes you don't even need an MRI to diagnose tumors or look at the substantial disc herniations in the spine. You can also see just the Hounsfield units for various um, various brain various brain structures, and I'm not going to go through all of these in any significant detail. So remember that MRI, <laughs> all right, is so we'll come to the next slide first. Um, the MRI is based on intensity. So we talk about hyper-intense and hypo-intense. And MRI is essentially a device that allows us to, to magnetize protons, and then we look at how they relate uh, and how they respond over time. So that the two major uh, entities in obtaining an MRI scan are the TE, which is the echo time, and the TRR, which is the relaxation time. You'll notice that TRs tend to be in the 1,000 ranges, whereas TEs tend to be in the 50. The T1 image is essentially a short TE and a short TR, and the T2 weighted image is essentially a long TR and a long TE, just so that you have an idea of what they're like. When you end up with these intermediate scans that alter um, TEs and TRs, you get a variety of other entities, uh, proton density images, spin density images, and a variety of, of other things. So one of the things that's interesting on an MRI scan is the appearance of blood, and it's often difficult to remember what blood looks like on each sequence. So there's this uh, mnemonic that, that was developed that says IV, so you look at T1 and T2, so for hyperacute blood, so IV is, uh, uh, is iso-intense, so K to brain, all right, B is, B is bright, so IV, itty, which is ID, right, so bright, dark, for, for blood that's between six hours and 72 hours, Itty bitty, bright dark, baby, bright bright, and doo doo, which is DD. So I B itty bitty baby doo doo. And then you have to just remember <laughs> what the times are. But it's but I think it's it's probably the easiest mnemonic that I know of to look at it rather than trying to draw curves and so forth that we all used to draw. Um, other things that are about MRI basics, there's only a few things that are really bright on T1. All right, fat is bright, melanin is bright. So if you have a melanoma, it tends to be right on T1. Most other pathology tends to be dark. Subacute blood, as we just talked about, is bright on the T1 weighted image. And then onyx, which is an embolization agent, also tends to be bright on T1. So very few things are bright on T1. All right, so most pathology is, is low signal on T1. 
all right? And most pathology is bright on T2 images. So these are just sort of imaging basics. Of course, you can give contrast with either CT or MRI to make it more sensitive and to give you more detail. <coughs> and then I told you there are multiple sequences that have been, been developed that you'll just have to, to look up. But they each have their own uh, special <coughs> reason for existing and their own ability to diagnose certain, certain disease processes. All right, so from a normal brain standpoint, um, this is just to get us used to looking at, at hematoma, some of which we'll look at very briefly. But essentially all we're looking at is scalp followed by bone, and then that space between the bone and the covering of the brain, the dura, which is the epidural space. The subdural space is a potential space outside the pia and below the dura, and then the subarachnoid space that Dr. Ahmed talked about quite a bit, and we'll talk about it very briefly. We can diagnose stroke on CT scan, but remember that stroke won't show up probably for a period of anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. It typically is a hypodense area, so remember we're talking about density, so a hypodense area and a vascular distribution, all right? And this is probably a scan that's 24 hours old. And we're essentially looking for the change in the appearance of the brain, the, the differentiation in where the midline lies, whether there's a shift, because this will drive surgical therapy. In addition to doing a, a a neurologic evaluation, right? Nothing substitutes for a good neurologic evaluation. And then sort of subtle things can be found too, like this little bit of hypodensity right here, which could be an early stroke or can be an indication that there's something worse lying underneath it. Sometimes giving contrast will help to sort out if this is something worse. And then blood is, is tends, to be, tends to be bright, at least in the acute stage. Hyperacute blood is isodense with brain and chronic blood tends to be dark, and we'll look at that when we talk about uh, subdural hematomas. All right, so uh, CT angiogram, uh, which didn't exist when I trained, but has become very uh, accurate in diagnosing uh, intracranial lesions, such as this, uh, this aneurysm that, that's sitting right here. So pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and Osm could tell you if they're, if they're operating on, on CT angio now. I think a lot of people are rather than doing formal angios. Um, this looks pretty similar to Osmond's picture of intracerebral hemorrhage. Might even be the same picture. We probably stole this from the same partner. All right, but this, this plot sitting in the brain has a variety of things that could be the differential diagnosis. We talked about AVMs earlier. Uh, this could be uh, related to uh, uh, AVM, could be aneurysmal hemorrhage, could be a tumor that's underlying that, and a variety of other things that may be responsible for that. So you have to think about that in the differential diagnosis. Hypertension also in the differential diagnosis, and hypertensive hemorrhages tend to be in fairly characteristic locations, basal ganglia, uh, uh, cerebellum, um, uh, et cetera. So those are typical, typical spots that you may, may find it. Traumatic lesions include things like petechial hemorrhages, which are basically just small dots of blood. These are indicators that the brain is either accelerated or decelerated, and remember that gray matter and white matter decelerate and accelerate at different speeds so that you get this shearing and shearing of axons, which can lead to these little petechial spots. And the prognosis of petechial hemorrhages is based upon a few things. Uh, the number of hemorrhages, where they're located, and the patient's presentation and how they look when you first see them. Contusions occur uh, in the brain also. They tend to be on the surface or they tend to be uh, overlying bony prominences. So once again, fairly characteristic, and there's usually a history of trauma that, uh, that goes with it. Subarachnoid blood, as we talked about earlier, can be either uh, traumatic, um, which tends to be more over the convexity, or can be subarachnoid based upon uh, aneurysmal rupture, which tends to be in the basal cistern. So you won't get the entire picture of this unless you've looked at all of the imaging studies. Intraventricular blood can also be related to trauma, but can also be related to, to aneurysms. It can be related to aneurysms that are close to the to the subarachnoid or to the uh, ventricular space, either basal or tip aneurysms, uh, which characteristically rupture into the third and uh, lateral ventricles, or pica aneurysms, which tend to rupture more into the posterior fossa. Characteristic uh, traumatic hematomas include the epidural hematoma, which tends to be biconvex, which differentiates it from a subdural hematoma, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit and uh, uh, tends to respect suture line, so it tends not to cross a suture line in the brain. So some of the hints that, uh, that can, can tip that off. This is one of those real emergencies uh, that, that we have in neurosurgery. Patients often go from being lucid to being not lucid, and these are typically associated with a fracture, typically through the middle meningeal artery. All right, so 
this is pretty subtle, right? This is either hyperthetical. How many? Okay, whatever. <laughs> she does this to everybody and just ignore like everybody else has. <laughs> Um, so, in any event, uh, blood that is hyperacute or that's in subdural hematoma, subacute, uh, tends to be isodense to brain. So, blood things that are bleeding at that point tend to be uh, this iso intense color. But also, uh, blood that's subacute can be like this. So, you really don't notice that there's much of anything here. You wait a little bit longer, it becomes hypodense. If you looked at this earlier, it would have been quite bright on uh, on scan. This is a typical example of a subdural hematoma, which tends to cover, acute subdural, which tends to cover more the surface of the brain, extending from anterior to posterior, produces midline shifts. So the midline structures, which should be here, are sitting over here. And we often decide about surgery based upon how much midline shift there is, even if the patient is, is wide awake. So just a subtle example of that. And then the chronic subdural that we see quite often becomes, after about, uh, after about three weeks, becomes basically hypodense in appearance tends to be more liquidy, um, and these can be drained through easier procedures other than craniotomies. All right, that covers, that covers brain. We're going to cover spine really quick since we've had a lot of talk about it. But this is a patient of mine who is a, a world champion barefoot water skier. So this gets into Doug's evaluation of, of uh, traumatic spine injuries. And really, uh, the, the workhorse of this is CT scanning to look at fracture morphology. And that's the only reason I show this. I talked about earlier about being able to window the CT scan to look at bone. So this is a very, uh, very good example of a teardrop fracture, right? Which is compressive uh, loads with shear at the site of the injury. And this, this woman actually would be quadriplegic, but you can get a large amount of data by looking at the bone windows through this. You can also get ideas about things like uh, hematoma within the canal. Um, I won't talk much about plain films other than one discussion about, uh, about normal alignment in the cervical spine. MRI is very good for, for unexplained deficits. Um, for instance, this patient actually presented with four limb quadriparesis, but actually had a C7 fracture, and that didn't make sense. So we ended up getting this MRI on him, and we actually saw all this high signal in the upper, upper portion of the cord, and this patient actually has a hypoplastic uh, odontoid process and flexed his spinal cord over that. And I won't tell you how he did it. It's a more or less a more interesting story. And the other thing that you see is this high signal, all right, within the spinous ligaments. The problem is that MRI in the face of acute trauma can be somewhat confusing because a lot of patients have strain and it's difficult to interpret exactly what that, what that strain is and what it means clinically. All right, just another example of that. And then I'm going to just mention these four lines of contour that we can look at. Um, when we talk about clearing the C-spine or getting plain films, the ABCs. So first A is adequacy. So you want to be able to see C7 on T1. There's four lines of contour, one along the anterior vertebral body, one along the posterior body, the next along the spinal laminal line, and then the tips of the spinous processes. All right, so those are the four lines of contour that we talk about. They need to line up, and so you should look at all plain films to assess that. Doug talked about quadriquina syndrome and how the how the disc should actually fill uh, the entire canal and have no CSF run, and just a typical appearance on a T2 weighted image. And you can tell that this is a fat suppressed image, right? Because the fat's dropped out, and you have this large disc herniation sitting there. Once again, MRI, great for soft tissue, um, not quite as good for bone. You really shouldn't make bony evaluation based on an MRI. CT, it remains the workforce. All right, so there's your brief tour. All right, I'm happy to take any questions, but. Uh, Kira's going to throw me off here, I'm sure, in about two <laughs> seconds. All right. You'll get sick of hearing my voice this weekend. I also apologize for my, uh, uh, for my uh, wardrobe. Uh, the airlines have my luggage somewhere between Madison, Wisconsin, and, and here. So there's about 13,000 miles where it could be. Mostly not with me. Thank you.